Our subscribers get it with exclusive access to breaking news, briefs, reactions, opinion, and process. iPolitics, are you up for it? Hello and welcome to part two of iPolitics Hot Topic Panel on Innovation. With me are Rob Rosenfeld from U15, Andre Albanati from Ernst Cliff Strategy Group, and Rob Annan from MyTax. Now in part one we discussed a bit about what innovation is and why it's so important, having established that it's apparently quite important. Um, and I want to get into how Canada's doing on this front. And Andre, maybe I'll start with you on, on that tack. How do we rank? Uh, well, I think Rob will take us through uh, how we're doing with our public sector research, which mm -hmm. is uh, we're you know punching way above our weight uh, globally, which is terrific. I think um, one of the areas that uh, that the Council of Canadian Academies and their reporting that they've done uh, a series of other reports, the uh, uh, Jenkins report on innovation, a number of reports on commercialization, on venture capital, on aerospace, uh, the Emerson panel, and so forth. Is uh, and it's something that the Department of Finance um, uh, itself and Industry Canada is quite concerned about. Is uh, is how do you stimulate private sector R and D? So we're falling behind on that, and largely um, uh, Canada is uh, not producing the number same number of patents that uh, other co uh, other countries are, competitors are. Um, our productivity is uh, quite frankly very bad. Um, and uh, labor productivity, it's something, multi-factor productivity, uh, you know, we're, we're doing very poorly at that. Um, and that's something that uh, governments are trying to figure out, you know, how do, they, how do they fix that? And one of the things that they're looking at is the balance between uh, the public sector research, uh, funding and, and stimulus and, and measures that go into that uh, versus the, the kind of measures that uh, uh, are there to support uh, Canadian business. And so they're worried that they don't have that balance right. So they're both, and that's not just money. It's not just talking about, you know, how, how many dollars are on the table. In fact, it's about, is it, do they have the right set of policies, uh, the right set of tools? Um, are they connecting uh, Canadian uh, research organizations uh, properly to the private sector. Um, uh, traditionally, there's been this kind of view that uh, we've been pushing research out to the private sector and that uh, really what we need to be doing is actually uh, pulling uh, uh, interest and intelligence and so forth from the private sector into our research communities and uh, developing new innovative products and processes that way. So I think of uh, organizations uh, that the federal government have been funding like Genome Canada, um, CIHR, uh, and who partner with universities and private sector are increasingly looking at uh, ways in which they can partner and, and ways in which they can uh, uh, tangibly ret put a return on investment. And, and that's, that's, what, uh, that's what the government is, is, is interested in. Can they increase the return on investment from the, pri from the public sector while uh, stimulating uh, uh, the private sector to actually spend money on R&D and increase uh, on R&D? Okay, and maybe just so uh, we sort of mix up the, the, the bad with the good, can you tell us a bit more about how we're doing in terms of uh, public sector? Uh, as Andre said, we hit well above our weight. Um, what do you mean when you say that? Um, Canada's uh, population is relatively small compared to other G8 and to many of the nations that we compete with on OECD ratings. And Canada has uh, between 4 to 5 percent global yeah. citation in academic reports. It's unheard of for a population that's 0.9% yeah. research-wise per yeah. 0.9.5. It is really something else that um, a successive series of studies that have been done in surveys uh, to uh, international academics uh, ranks Canada very highly in its reputation as being a world-class place where research is undertaken and the quality of it. Uh, and so we've really been able to uh, take advantage of the investments government has made in ensuring that we attempt to remain world class uh, as institutions and places of learning. Um, but it's, it's a constant race. It's never over. And we're in a situation, as I think we're going to discuss in Chapter 3, where we are seeing people behind us mm -hmm. uh, really beginning to catch up. Or in some of our situations here, we're beginning to fall back even. But uh, the, from the public sector, uh, we do an investment uh, in research and development that has been increasing um, year after year, while we're seeing, unfortunately, in the business sector, an investment or BERT um, decreasing. Now, yeah. it's still greater by a factor of about $4 billion, but 
that is ever diminishing at each time. And it's something which is alarming because you would like to the private sector to be uh, uh, more engaged in supporting research and development. But, and maybe I should ask that question here and open to anybody who feels like answering, but what is it that ac accounts for that relative deficit of private sector innovation in Canada? What are the factors that feed into that? Well, that's kind of a $64,000 question. Uh, I mean, the several billion uh, dollar question. Several billion. Here. And we've had n a numerous <laughs> panels uh, asking that question. I mean, just for context, I mean, the private sector spends a lot of money on research, there's no doubt. But as a share of GDP, um, relative to other OECD countries, for instance, um, our business expenditures on R&D ranks us 20th in the world. So, uh, you know, we're, we're not, our businesses are not investing at the same rate as other countries' businesses. And that really has impact on our productivity and on our economy. And so successive governments have spent a lot of time and a fair bit of money trying to stimulate investment. Uh, you know, so why, why is industry not investing? Well, there's a variety of, of reasons. One, for example, one potential explanation has to do with the way, for instance, government supports R&D through, uh, through industrial R&D. As Andre said, it's not just about the absolute amount of money, but often it's the distribution. And in Canada, we have a tradition of, of supporting business R&D through an indirect mechanism, uh, namely the, uh, uh, the research and development tax credit, the shred, so-called shred tax credits. And this is an indirect mechanism which is really designed um, to ascend, you know, to incent uh, R&D, but to do so indirectly versus, say, direct funding mechanisms, which are more prevalent in the United States and in Europe, where you actually have, uh, in some ways, sort of upfront uh, investment by government uh, in, you know, uh, sort of promising research or, or strategically important research and so on. Um, it, we're an outlier, you know, 70 to 80% of our investment in shred, uh, only, you know, maybe 30% in uh, direct investment. That may, that may be one contributing factor. Uh, our business managers aren't as well educated as most uh, business educators, uh, business managers in other countries. We don't hire the same number of PhDs per capita as other countries. So there's a, a number of indicators that point to possible explanations, but um, it's a thorny question. It's not. It's not obvious. Well, it's a bit of a chicken and egg too, right? Because if you're an innovative company, you're going to hire PhDs. If you're not a company that re invests in innovation, you're not going to hire PhDs. So, yeah. beyond yeah. government yeah. policy, are, are there broader structural issues that uh, are uh, a part of this? I think we should recognize that this is not a new problem by any mm -hmm. stretch of the imagination. That a Senate report in the 70s uh, that was commissioned in Canada concluded that we had been worried about innovation in our business community in 1919 and around that time. So it has been a long-standing issue within Canada uh, about how to address the fact that there are, th that we just are not ranked and we're not engaged as much in the private sector on innovation. Um, yeah, it, 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 that's right. Um, we've also been right next door to one of the most dynamic and innovative economies in the world, uh, the United States. So uh, listen, uh, Canada has a, coexisted with the United States, has signed uh, NAFTA agreements and so forth, which actually was the starting of, I think, uh, uh, an, an increase in uh, innovative productivity, but um, I, you know, Canada had many uh, closed monopolies uh, markets. Uh, so uh, Andrea Mandel Campbell, for example, uh, uh, why Mexicans don't drink Molson, sort of talked, looked at the you know one of the sectors she looked at was the beer, you know, sort of brewing sector, and said you know uh, it's these odd closed loop uh, monopolies that uh, couldn't even trade across provincial borders, let alone globally. Mm -hmm. So. You know, they innovate within their tiny, tiny niche. Mm -hmm. um, uh, also, for those companies who do trade with the United States, um, we're, we're socially and culturally quite similar, so it's easy. So, you know, so you don't need to work as hard to innovate to uh, find new ways to sell your product, to engage more directly. So, um, uh, you know, it's not that Canadian business has been lazy, but they've, they've had, uh, they haven't had to have the novel innovation uh, they've had process innovation and smaller incremental innovation pieces because they could get the larger innovation from the U U.S. I'll okay. also say one one other yeah. thing, just around stru structural issues. Yeah. For instance, yeah. the, you know the Canadian economy um, is is different than the American economy and a lot of other con economies. Uh, a recent Bank of Canada report actually looked at um, firm size 
as one potential me uh, me uh, method of explaining this productivity gap and found that, in fact, Canada's uh, basically a nation of small businesses. And relative to the United States and European countries, we have a very small number of large global businesses. We have a very large number of small businesses, and they tend to underinvest in R&D. They tend to or invest less in R&D than their large counterparts. They tend to hire fewer PhDs or um, highly educated managers. And so these smaller firms, uh, and in Canada, I think it's true. I think we really do, in some ways, um, celebrate our small and medium-sized businesses by but uh, if we were to actually grow those to, the fact, to the, have the same distribution as in the United States, in fact, we would make up nearly half of the productivity gap we currently experience with the U.S. So sometimes attacking these issues around innovation and productivity don't happen head on. They actually happen through, you know, for instance, you know, are there um, policy issues that are preventing firm growth? You don't think of that as a direct way of attacking innovation, but in fact, it would actually have an impact. It's an innovative way of looking at the problem, too. Um, that's actually an excellent point to uh, end this section of the discussion on, is uh, how we tackle the problem, because how we tackle the problem and how we get governments to tackle the problem is what we're going to address in part three of this panel discussion. Uh, so once again, Rob, Andre and Rob, thanks very much for uh, chatting with us, and uh, please check back for part three.